Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Pocket Now Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Figara. What's going on, everybody? All right, so I'm finally back from like a three-week jaunt around the Pacific Ocean. I We went down to Hawaii for the Qualcomm Tech Summit. Obviously, you saw a lot of us there. Uh, and then after that, I went to Oppo Innovation Day. And both of these things we kind of talked about in the last couple of episodes. But last episode, you did get a glimpse at a pretty unique place that I was staying at in Tokyo, uh, Book and Bed Tokyo. But I'm finally back from that and I'm here at home. Uh, It is Southern California. So compared to a lot of people out there who might be freezing right now in the cold, uh, we have a very temperate like 70, 75 degrees Celsius here. So I'm pretty I feel I'm feeling pretty lucky. I'm here at home. And to anybody out there, no matter where you are right now, as long as you're spending the holiday season with your family, with people you love, with your friends, as long as you're having a good holiday season, I hope everyone is. Uh, So let's go ahead and nestle in for our episode right before Christmas. Christmas. All right, so let's start things off on this episode talking about the main trend that I think everyone got really excited for and it started to become a real thing, foldables. Now, Jaime already talked on the Pocket Now Daily about the emergence of the Samsung Galaxy Fold 2, or that's at least what we're calling it at this point, because some leaked images on Weibo don't really give us a whole lot more than the fact that this is a clamshell device. And I just wanted to give a couple of opinions on this because foldables are finally making it to the market and the Samsung Galaxy Fold in particular is a very popular device, at least amongst our tech friends. Uh, There are quite a few of them who were at the Qualcomm Tech Summit in Maui. Uh, They were sporting Galaxy Folds and even if they were review units or they were units that they bought themselves, they were pretty happy to be using it. Form factor is obviously a big reason why foldables became a big thing this year. Uh, You obviously have certain form factors like a smaller phone that then folds out into a tablet. That's the Galaxy Fold. You also have some really crazy eye candy looking ones like the Huawei Mate X. Uh, But then the reason why I find this Galaxy Fold 2, if that's what we're going to call it, the reason why I find it so interesting is because we just got the Motorola Razr, which has been delayed. Unfortunately, we're not going to be getting our hands on it um, quite when we thought we would. Uh, But now we have the foldable market actually providing the form factors that I think a lot of people can really get behind. You saw with the Moto Razr, you just have a small clamshell device that does have a screen on the front, so you can do a couple of things on the Moto Razr's front, and then you open it up and it becomes a regular size smartphone. That form factor actually makes a lot of sense to me because you tend to have smartphones becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, and now we have found a way to maintain that large screen size and then just bring it down to a smaller form factor when you're not necessarily using it all the time. But what I find so interesting about the emergence of this Samsung phone is is that everyone will expect it to have those high-end specifications that in the case of the Motorola Razr, it didn't really seem to hit those marks. It is a boutique, fashion-forward phone that has a form factor that is very eye-catching, but then the specifications make you raise your eyebrows a little bit because it's not a flagship phone in that sense. Meanwhile, with the Samsung Galaxy Fold 2, we might be getting a high-powered smartphone that happens to fold, and that is pretty damn exciting in and of itself. But I feel like this begs a few different questions, because if Samsung is going to release a second version of the Galaxy Fold after their first Fold finally came out after its own delay, uh, well, it seems that Samsung just has enough money to pour into not only their main flagship uh, traditional lines, but also into their innovative and let's say experimental foldables market. To some people that might end up being a good thing because we have a radical change finally coming in smartphones and things are starting to become exciting again. And there was once upon a time that that form factor was actually the most prevalent one out there. And now if we're able to make it into a smartphone, well, that just means good times for everybody. And of course, if you look at it from a practical standpoint, Samsung's not really going to move to the Fold or the Galaxy Fold line more than they would for their Galaxy Note or their Galaxy S lines. We should be able to still expect those particular phones coming to market at the same time every single year like we have expected for the past, let's say, 8 to 10 generations now. But now the Fold is going to hit its second generation, so it's almost as if Samsung is is playing a little bit of catch-up with themselves, making sure that the Galaxy Fold has just as much of a pedigree as their established lines so far. 
So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and pass the first question off to all of you to talk about in the comment sections down below, and I'll respond to some of them next week. Your first question for this episode, do you think that foldables could become the more common form factor when it comes to our smartphones? Do you think that we're going to see so many more of them in 2020? We're obviously near the end of 2019, near the end of an entire decade, and with every decade come very new trends, so we could see the foldables actually become a huge thing soon. And on top of all of that, just give me some of your reactions to the leaks of this new foldable Samsung device. I do like that there is that second screen on the folded down top portion of the phone. And then when you open it up, it looks a lot like a Samsung Galaxy S10, uh, which I actually kind of adore. It's one of my favorite phones of the year. Uh, so that's one of the quick takes from my favorite 2019 devices. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and get into our break. I'll give you your community roundup and then let's talk about some devices I'm really into from 2019. All right, so let's get into the tech community roundup for this week. Obviously, a lot of the videos that you're going to see this week and probably next week, there actually are a lot of them already, uh, are these roundups of 2019, products that people really loved in this particular year, and maybe even some retrospectives from the decade itself. One in particular that I really enjoyed was from Peter McKinnon. He actually talked about just some products that he really liked. And I just want to give a quick shout out to the last product that he talked about. One of them uh, was the AeroPress Go. I actually got my own. And this is one of those things that is not really uh, tech or electronic even. Uh, it's just a really good coffee maker. And it finally came out. I actually pre-ordered the AeroPress Go quite a long time ago when it was first announced. And it finally became available this month. I finally got mine like two Two days ago. Michael Fisher, Mr. Mobile, put out his review of the Microsoft Surface Pro X, uh, a device that is really interesting because it is a full Windows device, but it runs on an ARM processor developed by Qualcomm, uh, which means that not all of your applications are going to work. So this thing is very specific to certain use cases. I want to give a quick shout out to John Rettinger. Uh, he is about a year removed from selling Techno Buffalo, and he does a bit of a retrospective in a video called Why Apple, uh, where he talks not only about his journey up until now, but also a couple of his insights as to why he sticks with Apple products. Is your Wi-Fi feeling old? And by that, I'm asking, does it buffer while streaming? Does connecting new devices slow it down? Can it handle gaming video calls, large file transfers? How about all at once? It doesn't matter how fast your internet connection is if your Wi-Fi router is old and outdated. With Orbi Wi-Fi 6 from Netgear, your Wi-Fi will feel new or maybe even young again. Wi-Fi 6 is the latest tech that allows more devices to connect and stream simultaneously without impacting speed or reliability. The result delivers the fastest Wi-Fi for all of your devices anywhere in your home. Stream in HD, 4K, and even 8K without buffering. Wow, 8K. Eliminating lag while gaming and connect more devices to your Wi-Fi than ever before. Orbi Wi-Fi 6 is like upgrading your Wi-Fi to first class. If you are ready for Netgear's best Wi-Fi ever, you can get it today from Netgear and never worry about Wi-Fi again. Check out Orbi Wi-Fi 6 at your local Best Buy or at netgear.com slash best Wi-Fi. That's netgear.com slash best Wi-Fi. And I guess with all of that said, I'm going to jump on that bandwagon a little bit and give a couple of my favorites from 2019. Now, one thing that I need to preface is that these are my opinions. These aren't necessarily the opinions of uh, Pocket Now or even to that point, Jaime. Uh, he'll probably do something or share in some sort of way his favorites from the year. But to be honest, the reason why it's important that we talk about 2019 and indeed the decade as a whole is because we really ended it with a bang. I mean, I just talked about foldables in the previous segment. And I think that it's important for us to take a look at just how many products came out in 2019. Because if you take a look at the way the smartphone industry was when it was first really burgeoning in like 2011 to 2014, let's say, well, we basically got the same amount of phones in this one year that those four years brought us in the main flagship market. Samsung is a good example, and I think that's going to be where I start with this little retrospective because I have to admit that while there are so many different Samsung devices out there, and you could even uh, use one of the previous generation phones and still be okay in 2019 moving into 2020, I gotta say the offerings that were in 2019 were stellar. Uh, the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus still remains one of those phones that I would recommend to most people. And then I have to give a shout out to the phone that I actually bought. Now, when the Samsung Galaxy Note 10 and the Note 10 Plus were announced, I was all about the Note 10. I could not get over the fact that a Note device could actually have all of the features it has, but 
come in at a smaller form factor, one that was more accessible, one that was against the trend of phones getting larger and larger with every iteration. And also, that red color was just so damn hot, so I had to find one, even though it wasn't at the time released in North America, I actually had to get one from Hong Kong. So a shout out to Issa Rodriguez and Ben Sin of Ben's Gadget Reviews for finding a way, uh, to kind of working together to find this place in Hong Kong, and then Ben brought it to IFA where I picked it up from him, so big shout out to Ben. Um, I bought that particular phone and I loved using it, especially uh, during that IFA where I recorded a lot of really fun stuff that happened in Berlin. Now, that's not to say that those Samsung phones were the best of 2019. Those are just the phones that I find quite memorable. And as I have been asked throughout the year, what phone should I be getting? They are one of the first phones that come to mind. But not trailing too far behind is a phone that I would recommend to anybody who is on a budget. And I think you know which one I'm going to be talking about. Of course, I'm talking about the Pixel 3a. The Pixel 3a was kind of a revelation, and I get it. For anybody out there who might be living in parts of Asia, maybe in Europe or uh, other parts of the world where you have phones like Xiaomi's and Realme's and all of these other phones that are low price points with really powerful specs, I get it. Here in North America, we don't really have any of those phones, so when the Pixel 3a came out it gave everyone a taste of what a three or four hundred dollar phone can be like uh, especially when compared to the flagships and you know what it really held its own the pixel 3a was yet another phone that i actually bought myself because i was just that intrigued by it now to be fair i did not get a review unit of the pixel 3a so that was one of the reasons why i had to pick one up myself uh, but what happened was i made a choice to get the smaller one and i did not look back the pixel 3a is going to be a phone that i still hold on to uh, because i bought it it wasn't that expensive anyway and honestly it's a phone that i could kind of go back to if for whatever reason I kind of change careers or I choose not to, you know, review all of these other smartphones that come out, the Pixel 3a, I could be pretty happy with it. That whole lack of a review unit thing uh, is also the reason why I had to get an iPhone 11 Pro myself. So that's the last phone that I ended up buying for myself. And for a while there, the combination was pretty simple. It was iPhone 11 Pro. After all, I needed an iOS device so that I can continuously test it. Uh, I did my review on it. Uh, but as far as Android phones went, aside from phones I was reviewing, it was either the Pixel 3a or the Galaxy Note 10. I actually have a lot of single sign-on applications on the iPhone as opposed to any other Android phone because we change Android phones so often that I end up having to sign into my accounts incessantly. Every time I get a new phone, I have to sign into yet another one and lose the data on the original phone and all that. You know what? iPhones change once a year, so I will say that that level of convenience is very nice to have as a tech reviewer. Just put all of the single sign-on applications on the iPhone and you don't have to worry about it as long as you have it on you. So without actually saying that these were the best phones of 2019, I'll just say that those were the ones that I ended up gravitating to the most. And those are the ones that I remember uh, quite a bit. I understand that foldables and all of these other crazy trends that started or uh, began proliferating in 2019, those are all noteworthy. And of course, I talked about it in the first segment, uh, but I don't necessarily own any of those particular phones. Uh, and I don't know if I'll be getting a Galaxy Fold anytime soon. Maybe in 2020, I will have the fun to be able to do so. Uh, but as far as the phones that I actually afforded and bought for myself, these were the ones that really stuck out to me. But there's one more device that I want to make sure I mention, and it is one of those things that we all got in the tech community. People like myself and Jaime and Michael Fisher, we all ended up getting a Nintendo Switch Lite, but none of us ever ended up really reviewing it uh, because you know, there's a backlog and tech keeps moving so quickly. And to be honest, in my case, one of the reasons why I never was able to construct a full 10 minute video on it is because I was having too much damn fun playing it. Now, I know, gaming phones became a huge thing in 2019, and they are all pretty spectacular, especially the ROG Phone 2, which I have been testing a little bit more recently, uh, happens to be a gaming phone with all of the performance and all of the things that that entails that happens to also be a good just general phone and has a decent camera to boot. That is a phone that deserves some credit. However, if you're talking about mobile gaming, gaming on the go, I honestly believe that the Nintendo Switch Lite is the pinnacle of mobile gaming. 
And the Switch Lite just manages to bring the Nintendo Switch uh, console experience to a fully portable device. Nintendo hasn't really made a fully portable device since the 3DS or any of its updated iterations, but now with the Switch Lite, they've achieved it. And because Nintendo has such an open door policy when it comes to third party developers, a lot of the games that you might end up seeing on mobile devices end up on the Switch Lite anyway, or in the Switch or in the Nintendo East shop. To be honest, if we only got Call of Duty Mobile or PUBG Mobile on the Switch Lite, or rather in the Nintendo eShop, we might be looking at the best way of playing mobile games pretty much ever. No, the Switch Lite shouldn't really be called a Switch because it doesn't dock to a TV. No, it shouldn't really be considered amongst the different gaming phones because it has a lower resolution screen. And no, it doesn't do that much more than play Nintendo games. Although, to be fair, there are a couple of media applications in the Nintendo eShop. But something has to be said for a device that just has a focus, and it does it really well. Uh, to be honest, the Switch Lite is exactly the Game Boy for our generation. Like with many a good gadget, you end up accessorizing with it, and I finally got the official case for it uh, that allows you to cover it up nice and easy, and it's a slim case, and then you just open it up. You don't even have to take the case off of the Switch Lite, you just play it with the flap open, and that just makes it even more of a portable device, because you could cover it up, throw it in the bag, right next to your smartphone perhaps, that is not that much smaller than it in some cases uh, and then you just take it out when you want to play some triple eight titles or you just want to have some controls with a mobile game that you might find in let's say apple arcade or google play pass uh, but instead it's on the nintendo eShop, and thus it's better on the switch Lite. and this is something i've been advocating for for a long time mobile gaming is more than just the call of duties and the PUBGs and the fortnites of the world mobile gaming is also a way of taking the games that were so good of yesteryear yester decade even and making them easy to play, more palpable, and more accessible to where we are right now. So yeah, the Nintendo Switch Lite, along with the phones that I mentioned earlier in this segment, are the devices that really gave me some feels in 2019. These are the things that I actually truly enjoyed as far as uh, mobile devices are concerned. So I want to hear what all of you think. Uh, in 2019, what were your favorite products? They could be smartphones, they could be gaming consoles, Switch, Switch Lite, whatever the case may be. Uh, but you can get into any other category. I just want to hear what your favorites were of 2019. Let's take a look back at this year and remember some of the great things that happened because from foldables to nostalgia man we had a lot to enjoy anyway that'll do it for the main segments of this episode i hope you enjoyed just sort of listening to me kind of gush and talk about foldables as a trend and then now the nostalgia kick that we got from a few different devices and also just my favorites from 2019 again these are all things that i'm going to bring with me to 2020 but i'm excited to see what the new decade brings us and with that why don't we go ahead and get into some comment responses I just looked back on that episode from last week where I was trying to be really quiet inside of Book and Bed Tokyo. The bookstore themed capsule hotel, or, you know, for lack of a better other word, hostel. I don't want to get too far away from the tech talk, uh, but yeah, if you ever find yourself in Tokyo, or I believe there are locations in Kyoto and Osaka, it might be something you want to check out. Honestly, it was a really interesting experience, um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun place. Got a little bit of tea for this part after all that talking I did just a little while ago. Uh, by the way, this is the cup from that AeroPress Go. Um, honestly, love this thing. It's a great, it's a great gift. If you want to get someone who's a coffee or even tea lover, I actually do use this coffee maker for tea like this. Um, yeah, it's it's a great gift. I, I honestly, I'm really happy it finally came in. I'd love to get this super chill JV voice as my Google Assistant. Well, it's really tough for me to do that on a consistent basis. Uh, I feel like. I would lose my mind if I had to talk like this all the time. Um, I, f I, f I feel like I'm talking like the people who do that NPR uh, hourly news roundup. Google needs to copy some root-only features from XDA. Man, do you remember back in the day when the only way you could get the best features that eventually became part of Android uh, just baked in, you used to have to install other ROMs. I'm sure people still do it now. But I remember back in the day with phones like the Droid Incredible, man, 
<laughs> that is a throwback from this decade. Droid Incredible, the Galaxy Nexus, and other phones of the like. Uh, Droid DNA was the one that I had after that. Uh, those particular devices, I remember rooting them and installing uh, third-party ROMs. The ones like MIUI, which now became Xiaomi as a company. Man, there were so many features back then that were just so useful, and you can only get them if you rooted your device. Uh, one of the, Just a couple of them off the top of my head while I have this thought process going. Um being able to change the music track by double pressing the volume buttons accordingly. The phone is perfect as it is. Keep it simple. Less is more. Wow. This is going to be the first time that I've actually seen someone say that the very minimalistic approach that the Pixel 4 uh, brought to the table is actually good. Um, I'm not saying that it's an opinion that no one has. It's just great to see that someone actually has it and put it into the comment section. I personally think that this phone is perfectly fine. It's not the best phone by any stretch of the imagination, but it does have a compelling camera. It does have a great uh, Android version in it. It is the stock Android experience that is supposed to get updated with the feature drops that I talked about last week, or, or rather on that episode, the very episode I'm responding to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I find it to be a good enough phone on the daily. It is not uh, the best phone out there. But then again, as someone who does tech reviews, uh, I've been mentioning this to a couple of other tech friends. The phone is not amazing the moment you start to compare it to other phones of the year. Not everyone does that. And I think that a lot of people who just pick up the Pixel 4 because they are genuinely interested in it and don't get to play with all the other phones that people like me get to play with throughout the year might actually have this opinion more often than not. Who's using Google Duo? LOL, myself and all of my family and friends. Really good for you, honestly. Like I used Google Duo a little bit with Isla Rodriguez, uh, and yeah, in our rela- in our long distance relationship, uh, Duo did actually come in handy quite a bit. Uh, but we kind of gravitated to just some other places like um, Telegram and Facebook Messenger for video calls and whatnot. I don't know. Maybe it might be time for us to go back to Duo. It was a pretty nice video app. The day Google brings back unlimited original quality storage on the Pixel 4, I am buying it. Preach. Recording at 4K60, that's a common one. Google Photos redesign and more ability when editing photos and 5G would also be fantastic. 5G, yet another thing that you won't be able to get just through a feature drop. 4K60, I completely agree with that. More ability when editing photos in Google Photos. Uh, I do actually have a solution to that that I could recommend right now. Uh, Shouts out to David Amell for reintroducing me to Snapseed. It is a powerful photo editing software that rivals that of Adobe Lightroom Mobile even on Android phones. You might want to check that out. A comment regarding smart glasses and the fact that David Amell and myself were talking about the Focals by North 2.0 becoming a thing. I'd love smart glasses and the ability to get messages, email, and Google Maps information via glasses. I would also love to take snap photos of swans taking off on the river or some other moment of nature event, as at the moment I think I wish I'd been quick enough to get my phone out. Yeah, that does. So what you're kind of looking for is something that the Focals kind of provides, which is notifications. Uh, But then it has to have a camera as well. This is the thing. Smart eyewear with a camera, that does bring up a couple of uh, concerns, not necessarily in terms of privacy, but just how people feel about their privacy. Because even the Snapchat spectacles tend to raise a few eyebrows when they see that little light going. And finally, I'm going to go ahead and just finish this off with a simple bruh. So with that in mind, make sure you get into the comment sections down below. Make your opinions heard. Tell me what you loved about 2019. And next week, why don't we go ahead and dedicate the final episode of the year to what we all appreciated about this year, this decade, before we move into a brand new one. And after that, I mean, damn, CES is right around the corner. So the busy time is going to come right back up again. But yeah, I just want to extend my gratitude to all of you. Thank you so much for sticking around with me as I uh, kind of find my voice on the Pocket Now Weekly podcast. Uh, That show has gone through a number of different changes, but for all of you who have stuck around, and it looks like a lot of you did like last week's show, um, yeah, I am really happy to just bring this to you every single week. Uh, I hope that I continue to do so for quite some time. Uh, And yeah, I'm just really appreciative to all of you for watching, listening, and also being a part of this show that is still so fun for me to make every single week. 
And with all of that said, I'm going to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, a Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever the case may be. Even if you're not into any of those things, I just want to wish you a wonderful winter season, end of 2019, moving into the new year. I will see you for one more show next week, and then we'll get into the new decade. From there, I'm going to go ahead and call it on this one, and I will see you in our next episode.